and welcome. My name is Maria Luisa Romero, and on behalf of Colombia Global Freedom of Expression, I would like to welcome you this morning. It is a great pleasure to start this dialogue on how free speech databases can strengthen free expression from a comparative legal approach as part of Colombia Global Freedom of Expression's celebration of this year's World Press Freedom Day. We would like to begin by thanking UNESCO for co-sponsoring this event. We're extremely grateful for the support that UNESCO has provided Global Freedom of Expression to help disseminate the international and national judicial decisions that best protect the free flow of information and expression, which is the focus of today's event. Each year on May 3rd, UNESCO's World Press Freedom Day is commemorated around the world to highlight the paramount importance of a free press and its fundamental role in ensuring a democratic society and defending other human rights. This day represents an opportunity for journalists, scholars, governments, international organizations, domestic actors, and civil society to reflect on the enormous challenges facing freedom of expression today and the best approaches to combat them. In a world that seems increasingly prone to authoritarianism and intolerance. It is precisely at this point that the conversation regarding instruments such as the ones we're going to present this morning acquires great importance. It is an urgent need to have reliable, easily identifiable and relevant information that serves as a source of authority, especially in the most difficult or significant cases. These instruments or tools that we're going to talk about today are intended to serve precisely this purpose. One of these tools is the Columbia Global Freedom of Expression database, which systematizes and analyzes judicial decisions on freedom of expression around the world, demonstrating not only the global conversation of international and domestic judges, but also what legal standards prevail in different jurisdictions. To date, more than 2,000 emblematic or landmark decisions on the most important, significant, and, and difficult issues have been analyzed and published in our database, and more than 30,000 visitors consulted every month, a number that illustrates the crucial importance, necessity, and interest in this powerful tool. As noted by President Lee C. Bollinger, founder of Colombia Global Freedom of Expression, the most important of the many activities and initiatives taken by Colombia Global Freedom of Expression, though it is in many ways the least likely to be heralded, is the simple idea of creating a database of decisions related to freedom of expression around the globe. Amazingly, before we developed this, there was no place one could go to get a comprehensive sense of the judicial and legislative decisions regarding freedom of speech and press, referencing international principles. In addition to the Colombia Global Freedom of Expression database, today we will present other powerful tools that share our mission of promoting and protecting freedom of expression worldwide through the sharing of information. We have the Cerula database from the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law in Strathmore University. We'll hear about the hate speech database from the future of free speech and also the forum for humor and the law. Our main interest is for these amazing tools to serve journalists, human rights activists, and ordinary citizens who face every day various forms of censorship, harassment, intimidation, and violence for exercising the right to freedom of expression for the benefit of us all. We hope that the strengthening and dissemination of methods such as the databases that we will be discussing today will increasingly contribute to our global conversation on freedom of expression and to the defense and advancement of this fundamental human right. With that, I turn it over to Dr. Holly Johnson, our dear associate director, who is also the institutional pillar and historical memory of this amazing program. Holly has been with Global Freedom of Expression for almost 10 years, and she has been key in developing the caseload database, as well as strategic partnerships, including our very important one with UNESCO and also other stakeholders. 
We are so grateful for her dedication and commitment to our database, and we all look forward to hearing from her and the incredible panel she has put together for this event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria Luisa, for the very kind introduction. So good morning, everyone, and welcome. And also to everyone who is joining us from all points around the globe. Defenders of human rights need access to comparative law to build persuasive legal arguments and facilitate effective advocacy campaigns. We are here to showcase four databases that do much of the groundwork for you. These organizations identify milestone freedom of expression cases and provide free, easy, and reliable access to the best national and international practices to protect free speech. The partners will illustrate how their databases can be used to identify standards and compare decisions across jurisdictions to show the emergence of important legal tests and principles. In addition, advocacy organizations FLIP and Trial Watch will present case studies and discuss how they use comparative law to build compelling arguments. These data databases provide an invaluable resource. The Global Freedom of Expression database alone, as Maria Luisa mentioned, hosts more than 2,000 case analyses of court decisions from 130 countries, including all the freedom of expression case law from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the African Court on Human and People's Rights, and the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights. Thanks to cooperation with UNESCO, versions of the database in Arabic, Spanish, French, Portuguese, and, Rush and Russian highlight emblematic cases based on key issues in each region, making these resources available to a broader audience. A special collection series of publications summarizes mm -hmm. in 15 thematic areas, ranging from the right to protest to the right to be forgotten. This resource, along with the databases of the partners here this morning, provide access to crucial knowledge for judicial decision-making and strategic litigation in freedom of expression cases worldwide. The 30th anniversary of World Press Freedom Day gives us a moment to reflect on what standards have been established over time, what challenges persist, and what new threats need to be addressed. Themes over the past decade map these changes and concerns from generational perspectives on press freedom in 1999 through covering the war on global terrorism in, 20, in 2002 to the media's role in advancing peaceful and just societies in 2017. Yet in many ways, 1993 feels like a different universe. Very few people had access to internet, there was no social media and no smartphones. The digital revolution changed the landscape forever. In the past 30 years, we have seen the emergence of digital rights together with changes that have impacted privacy, access to information and freedom of expression and have brought these different rights into conflict. These changes are reflected in recent World Press Freedom Day themes, such as a focus on freedom of information and access in 2010 and 2016, and last year's journalism under digital siege. Major shifts and threats to freedom of expression are paralleled by international responses in the form of declarations and mechanisms. The law and standards section of the Global Freedom of Expression website tracks and updates these developments. Behind me is a projection of a timeline created by our researcher, Sarta Gupta, showing some milestones of important declarations over the past 30 years, from the landmark 1993 Vienna Declaration, which recognized freedom of expression as a fundamental right and onwards. Advances on the right to information came as early as 1999, with a special UN report highlighting access to information on decisions that impacted people's lives. Access was again the focus of an Inter-American Commission declaration in 2000, with the right to access to the internet the subject of UN resolutions in 2016 and 2020. The early 2000s marked the emergence of digital rights, with declarations on the free flow of information and the importance of balancing that with preventing misuse of the internet. Guidance on countering hate speech without undermining the right to free expression came in 2013 with the Rabat Plan of Action and the 2019 World Press Freedom Day Addis Ababa Declaration recognized freedom of artistic expression, including by cartoonists and the challenges posed by disinformation. 
The UN Human Rights Committee has adopted no less than four general comments, elaborating protections on freedom of religion, freedom of expression, combating racist hate speech, and finally, reaffirming the importance of the right to peaceful assembly following a period of global protests between 2016 and 2020. The protection of journalists and freedom of expression has also been advanced through the recommendations of the high-level panel of legal experts on media freedom, such as with the report authored by John Yegensu, providing safe refuge to journalists at risk, and the report being launched today by Karuna Nundi on blasphemy laws. Despite the challenges over the last three decades, we have witnessed significant progress in the protection of freedom of expression as a fundamental right. The lawyers, activists, and judges here today are at the forefront of the defense against destabilizing forces of disinformation and digital authoritarianism. Our panelists are doing their part to give you the tools to do the job. And so now just a bit of housekeeping, uh, a word to our online viewers before we start, please put any questions you have in the chat. The speakers will take questions after each presentation and then again at the end, time allowing. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Mehdi Benchla, Senior Project Officer of the Division of Freedom of Expression and Media Development at UNESCO, who is going to provide some introductory remarks. Thank you, Holly. I don't know if you can hear me. So um, first, I'm extremely happy to be here. Um, and really, at first, I, I want to thank really uh, Global uh, Freedom Expression from uh, Columbia University for this partnership that uh, started in 2016, and uh, it has been a real pleasure to work with you. And uh, I think we, we together, uh, combining our efforts, we we really uh, did something very useful. Uh, I want to to uh, so to put a little bit of context. I mean, uh, this this year is the World Press Freedom Day. 30th anniversary uh, since the the start of the the the, the creation of this uh, this emblematic day uh, um, for WordPress Freedom Day and it's it, the the thematic of this year is um, freedom expression as a driver for all uh, other human rights because uh, freedom expression is a little bit particular right among all these uh, all the fundamental rights uh, because it's it's a right in itself of course the, the right to uh, to seek information in part and, and share uh express yourself it's it, it this is really an essential human rights in itself for all your, your individual also uh, it's a collective right but it's also a, an enabling right for all other human rights and that's i think it's something we we should not forget that uh there is no uh political right without uh, freedom expression there is no uh, right of assembly uh, right to vote uh, right to political participation uh, there is uh, there is no uh, there is no progress really on the issues of environment on the issue of uh, gender without freedom expression. <clears throat> I think there is not not even a possibility of progress human progress without freedom expression. Is it us you know uh, human beings are progressing because they share information. Uh, printing press is an incredible example of this. Uh, this is because of the possibility for, for human beings to share good practices, good ideas, and to make steps further. So this is a really a key, a key right that we we, sh we should not forget the the incredible dimension of this of this right. And when you start to curtail it, uh, you it entails a lot of uh, very bad uh, consequences for for the society as whole. Uh, hence, uh, because we all know that there is a lot of threats on freedom of expression, uh, although it's not an absolute right. The, the 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 limits that are imposed on freedom expression and the, and the, the one exercising it such as journalists in particular are really um uh, really uh, much too much compared to the to the and don't uh, abide to the criteria of international uh, standards so uh, unesco has developed this strategy to work with judicial actors uh in uh, since 2013 uh it's called the judge initiatives uh and it's uh, it's uh, it started in latin america First, and uh, it has some three pillars. The first one is to, was to develop resources uh, for judicial actors on international and regional standards on freedom expression for them to be more aware of the older dimension of freedom expression of the international standards, decision of the human rights court, uh, and the legitimate limits, for example. Um, so we develop uh, toolkits uh, for judicial actors on this issue, guidelines, uh, issue briefs, specific issue briefs, uh, uh, which are extremely important for oral capacity uh, building activities, so, which is the second pillar, is really the capacity building. And this is uh, go, UNESCO and its partner are working uh, via online trainings, uh, such as massive online course that we developed uh, in partnership with uh, different universities. 
Um, we actually are going to launch end of May uh, a massive online course on uh, international standards on film expression with uh, the Institute Bonavero of, uh, at Oxford uh, and UNESCO. And it's a five week course for all judicial actors who so judge prosecutors, lawyers, uh, uh, legal assistant, also academic. And uh, these course had a lot of success. So we did it pre periodically. Um, other uh, another part of the capacity building is a uh, is a workshop with uh, with judge and trainer of judges from judicial training institute. So we we had you know, uh, around the world, uh, UNESCO and his partner really uh, trained a lot of uh, legal expert and uh, legal actor judicial actors. We had around uh, twenty five thousand uh, judicial actors uh, that we engage on this issue, and it's absolutely essential to to keep working on that. Uh, the last part is really the partnership. This this can work only with strong partners. So we have a massive. We have a, a, a memorandum of understanding with the human rights courts, such as the the Inter American Court on human rights, the the African Court on human and people's rights, uh, but also ECOWAS Court of Justice and East African Court of Justice. Uh, but also the partnership is our institutions, such as uh, Columbia University. Uh, to develop database and to make available for all these judges and judicial actors, these uh, these prosecutors or these lawyers, these decision, these landmark cases that will help them to uh, use them when they take decision on when they are defending uh, clients, are defending journalists uh, which are being uh, prosecuted, for example, for uh, for uh, their work. Uh, and this uh, this uh, work and this partnership with Columbia University which we started in 2013, as I said, has covered many grounds to make available in different languages these cases that not only English, because uh, there are a lot of judges or judicial actors that don't, don't always master English. So it's important to have them available in other languages, in Spanish, in French, in Arabic, et cetera. Um, and we work, I think the first thing was, uh, the first um, thematic was on COVID, the issue That's of right. COVID. Yeah, uh, misinformation. misinformation related to COVID issues. <laughs> so we work on this first uh, and then uh, on privacy issues also, and uh, we are now going to uh, also um, work with Colombia to have a lot of cases related to election, because elections are a time of crystallization of tension, and journalists, of course, play an essential role, uh, but they are at threats during this period, I would say, even more. So to develop judicial cases, a database analysis of case of decision uh, on this specific context is the next project that we are going to work together. A um, uh, few other things. I, I think it's very important that we uh, keep working, all of us, on providing this database uh, with additional cases. But there is one dimension which is also very important, is the outreach. Uh, we need to make an effort to, um, to provide this decision to the university, to the courts, to the lawyers association, to, to be very proactive. I think it's important that we are developing that together, but also to exchange with other databases what are the good practices? What are their strategies? And to reinforce the cooperation, I think that's why we're very happy to support this uh, this uh, event today on this issue. Um, and the last thing I would like to say is uh, also a reflection on the artificial intelligence, the dimension of this, because um, this is going to be used. We have seen uh, lawyers using this uh, artificial intelligence tool, even judge taking using this to to uh, taking decision. So how these database are going to nourish? The, the this artificial intelligence program that's i think it would be interesting to see because this is probably one of the the field which will have, see a lot of development and uh, uh if this database can support uh better knowledge and and we'll see how it works with the artificial intelligence also this issue of copyright i think it's a reflection that i think we we should have at one point or another but that's it i i thank you uh for being there for uh so participating and i let uh, thank you Mandy, for those wonderful remarks and for all the support and so now we're going to hear from our partners and we're going to start with um important standards on privacy and access to information from juan manuel ospina he's a legal researcher with us at global freedom of expression and Daniel ospina Celis, he's a researcher at De Justicia in Colombia, who authored papers in our special collection series. They will be followed by Nelly Rotic, research fellow at the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law at Strathmore University in Kenya, who will introduce the Cirilla Collaborative on Digital Rights. So I now give the floor to Juan Manuel. Uh, thank you very much, Holly. Uh, let me share my screen uh, so you can see my presentation. 
There you go. And again, thank you very much, Holly, for your introduction uh, and to all the people who are here with us online and in person. I want to begin by saying it is a true privilege to be participating in this panel, especially amongst such a distinguished group of experts. Uh, as Holy already said, Columbia Global Freedom of Expression is a project uh, that seeks to further and develop our, our, our understanding of freedom of expression, spe specifically through the analysis of global case law and jurisprudence on the matter. Uh, there are several ways in which we do that, but today I want to highlight uh, two of them, which I consider to be central to our endeavors. Our database and our special collection of papers on the case law on freedom of expression. Uh, as as um, Columbia Global Freedom of Expression has the world's biggest database on freedom of expression case law. As Holy noted earlier, we have over 2000 entries in English about decisions issued in all corners of the world uh, from the beginning of the 20th century up until this year, regarding freedom of expression, of course. Additionally, at a smaller, uh, at a smaller scale, the database also provides resources to Spanish, French, Arabic, Russian, and Portuguese speaking users. Uh, but what exactly is there on the database, you may ask? Uh, actually, well, the database holds succinct summaries of decisions, we call them case analysis, issued mainly by judicial bodies, although there are decisions issued by administrative bodies or self-regulation mechanisms such as the Oversight Board. Uh, the summaries are written in plain and simple language without sacrificing rigor or precision to appeal to and be useful to a wide variety of stakeholders, such as litigators, academic researchers, activists, journalists, editors, and civil society uh, in general. The way the database, the database is assembled allows, allows users to easily establish filters to narrow the research by topic, country, year, type of court, as you can see in the right part of the, of the slide. Uh, this essentially provides researchers with a powerful tool to quickly and, effic and efficiently look up the information uh, they need. Uh, furthermore, there are two key elements that I want to underscore, underscore when it comes to our case summaries or case analysis. Each case analysis includes a summary and outcome section and a decision direction section, among other, among, among other sections. The first section outlines in an organized matter all the relevant aspects of the decision. Facts, procedure, arguments, and the court decision are included in one paragraph. By reading this synopsis, users can get a good grasp of the analyzed decision, thus improving the research experience by shortening the time spent on waiting. Uh, the decision direction found at the end of the analysis provides an assessment of the decision, whether, whether it expands or contracts freedom of expression, or it has a, a mixed outcome. This section provides two useful analyses that allows our audience to identify trends and common issues, and to understand when there has been backsliding or when advancing novel progressive legal theories have been uh, posed. Uh, you can see in the slide uh, what are more or less the criteria uh, we, we, we use when deciding uh, whether any particular decision falls into each of these, uh, if, if these categories. And I want to highlight how important are uh, global human rights standards when it comes to uh, this, this, this assessment, because ultimately I think this is a, a framework we have adopted when it comes to understanding freedom of expression as a right and as a global phenomenon. Uh, as you can see, case analysis are articulated to allow users efficient research. Upon reading, for example, these two central segments of any given case summary, it is easy for users to review case law in a swift way, focusing on controversial issues regarding freedom of expression at a global scale. I am a firm believer that a more holistic understanding of freedom of expression jurisprudence or case law 
is an invaluable resource for advocacy and strategic litigation. Uh, and at the same time, provides judges with a more robust conceptual toolbox to navigate complex cases. Now, as I told you, we made an important, we, we already made an important job in populating the database with a myriad of decision summaries. The next logical step we wanted to undertake was to systematize them in a manner, in a manner that further compounded our goal of providing rigorous and succinct legal research on freedom of expression. Uh, that's what that's where the special collection of papers come into play. Up to this date, we have published 11 papers. This provides a further systematization of our case analysis by topics such as privacy, slabs, access to information, uh, the so-called right to be forgotten. Uh, there are upcoming papers, as, as Holy uh, already noted, on, on, on topics such as content moderation and ele elections. Um, as you can see uh, in the slide, in the slide, the indexes of these papers are very illustrative. They provide useful taxonomies on issues related to freedom of expression, which in turn allows users to delve deeper into their research in a way that's just as equally efficient. Uh, as you can see uh, on the on the left, you, you can see the index of the paper on privacy, and on the right, there's the index on the of the paper on access to information. Uh, basically, what you see, uh, the papers have given us the opportunity uh, to delve deeper into, into topics related to freedom of expression. And I think uh, the papers in, in of themselves uh, allow researchers or users in general of the database uh, to search for specific topics th that they might be interested in. Uh, uh, in, in, in the context of, of the research, whether, whether it's academic research or uh, preparing important uh, cases in the context of strategic litigation. Um, now, um, I had uh, the immense privilege of, of uh, authoring and editing the uh, paper on privacy uh, for the program. So uh, I wanted to show you uh, how do we conduct uh, our work and how the database can be used as an efficient uh, uh, resource for, for researching. And, and I wanted to talk about two cases uh, that, that, that deal with this tension between privacy and, 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 and freedom of expression. Uh, the first case is the, the case of, of Mephisto. What you see uh, at, at, at the right part of the slide is the language pulled from the case summary and outcome of the case analysis. Uh, and, and this is precisely what I want to highlight, like how, how complete these summary and outcomes can, can be and how efficient uh, they can be in, in allowing research swift, swift, uh, the, the, the transmission, swift transmission of information. Uh, so basically, uh, the case of Mephisto is a case from 1971 from the uh, Federal Constitutional Court of Germany. In this decision, uh, this, this court uh, upheld a ban against a book written by Klaus Mann, in which uh, the title character of the novel uh, was based on a real-life actor, Gustav Grudgens, which you can, whose pictures you, you can see on the left. Uh, basically, the novel tells the story of an actor who colludes with nat Nazi powers during the war to advance to advance his career. Uh, the novel, once the novel was published, the the adoptive son of of Grudgens uh, brought proceedings uh, to looking to ban the book, uh, the book publication in West Germany. Uh, this case, which I think is a seminal case uh, on, on the matter, especially in, in Europe, there has there have been previous cases uh, dealing with this this tension previously in the United States, but but this case is very important uh, for Europe and for Germany. Uh, the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany upheld the the ban on the book, consider, although it highlighted the importance of artistic freedoms of freedom, it it considered too that uh, the right to dignity and other personality rights that are often uh, linked with privacy 
uh, was more important when weighed against freedom of expression. So this is the first case I wanted to, to, to talk about. Of course, it's an old case. It's a case that is available on our database. It's a case that had been was included in the in the, in the paper I, I, I authored. Uh, now we're going to go move a little further um, in time, uh, uh, but we're, we're 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 still in Europe. Uh, this is a case by the European Court of Human Rights uh, from two thousand four. Uh, this case. It also deals with the publication of a book. Uh, this is a case from 2004, as, as, as I said, in which the European Court of Human Rights considered that the fact that a, boon, a book was banned indefinitely was a disproportionate measure against freedom of expression. And I'm going to tell you what this book was about. This book was co-authored co by Dr. Gubler, who was a private physician of then president of, of France, François Mitterrand. Uh, the book, of course, revealed uh, secrets, uh, information that was covered under, under medical secrecy about, uh, about the president's health. Uh, the book was published after Mitterrand's death uh, and proceedings were brought by Mitterrand's widow uh, to, to ban the book and to, to obtain uh, civil damages compensations. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights, although uh, it noted uh, that Dr. Gubler had indeed uh, breached medical secrecy, uh, also considered that the information that was in the book was uh, of public relevance. It was important to the public to, 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 to it was important to political discussion uh, to, to, for the public to be able to know what uh, the state of Mitterrand's health uh, was. Uh, uh, this said, uh, the, the European Court uh, considered that an indefinite ba ban on the book uh, was a disproportionate measure. Although this case has a caveat uh, because uh, the court considered that uh, civil damages were not a disproportionate measure when it comes to restrictions on freedom of expression. Uh, so it didn't even uh, like uh, develop any arguments on this matter because civil damages were indeed awarded by domestic courts in this case. Uh, and the European court considered that these were, these were uh, permitted. Um, and the third case I wanted to, to talk to you about uh, uh, now concerns now now we're in, in Latin America specifically in in Argentina. This is a case by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, uh, Fontevecchia and Amico versus Argentina. Uh, still further in time, we're now in 2011. Um, this case issued by the by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights considered that the fact that two to, to journalists who published information on, on then president Carlos Saul Menem and, and uh, about his relationship uh, with a congresswoman and, 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 uh, pre and the, re the relationship with this congresswoman and the fact that they had uh, uh, an unrecognized, unrecognized son, uh, uh, the court considered that the fact that they were uh, sentenced to pay civil damages to, to the president after publication this information, which, which by all accounts was, was truthful, uh, the court considered this was a disproportionate restriction on freedom of expression. Um, uh, so, of course, it held also that uh, the, the, the applicant's right to freedom of expression uh, was, was violated. Uh, in this case, the court, of course, weighs the right to a private life of the president against the freedom of expression of journalists. And, and it ultimately considered uh, that when waiving these this, this rights, uh, the public interest, too, uh, was, was relevant uh, in this case because this information was important uh, for, for, for citizens in Argentina 
uh, to know because it uh, uh, ultimately political political figures such as the president who is the maximum authority uh, of the executive branch uh, was was important for for the public interest and and political these political figures uh, are are subject to a higher degree of scrutiny or or, a, or, or at least they should tolerate a higher degree of scrutiny well, so, Matt, well, yes, please wrap up. We're running a little. Yes, I, I'm, sorry. I'm wrapping up. What I wanted to limit to, to say in, with these cases is I think it's it's very easy to, to, to start catching on trends. The public interest doctrine, uh, we, we can see how it develops and matures over time. The first case, of course, doesn't consider it, while the last uh, it starts to develop on, on, on this. So I, I, I basically wanted to. Uh, to show how easy it, it is to use the database, the case analysis from the language pool from, from, from the summary and outcomes uh, to, to, to see, to catch on these trends in, in, a, in a way that it's, it's, it's so, so easy and direct. And I think it, it save it save us researchers a lot of time. So this is what I wanted to, to a general overview, of course, categorical conclusions on such a small sample are difficult to reach, but I think what I wanted to, to do was to poke your curiosity and show you a little bit how the database uh, can be used in a very effective way. Fabulous, Juan Manuel. Thank you so much. And now Daniel is going to um, jump on and he's going to compare, contrast and show us how privacy and access to information have collided in recent years. Thank you very much, Holly. Thank you. Um, Colombia Global Freedom of Expression and UNESCO for inviting me. I just want to, as Holly said, I wanted to show how Colombia Global Freedom of Expression database can be used to uh, advance access to information that sometimes is a bit neglected when we, we talk about freedom of expression, but it is a very important right. Um, I want to start saying, and um, as Maria Luisa, Juan, Holly said, uh, the Colombia Global Freedom of Expression hosts over 2,000 cases. And uh, as Juan showed us uh, when he was at the very beginning of his presentation, you can filter this database to narrow your research. And if you do so, and you decide to narrow, narrow your research, you can find that the database has more than 300 cases related to access to public information. Um, access to public information is of course a human right. It's been recognized by many different legal, international legal um, treaties and by many national and international human rights courts. It is one of the bases of democracy and of course a prerequisite for the enjoyment of other human rights as freedom of expression. However, in many countries, accessing information and especially accessing public information is very, is very difficult. Many journalists and human rights activists fight for increased transparency in many different topics and of course in many different contexts sometimes. We can fight for increased transparency on environmental information, on public expenditure, on information of political, figures such as what Juan said about Nemen, on even conflict of, of interest of some public officials, et cetera. However, when human rights activists, journalists seek for information, for public information, sometimes public authorities deny access to the requested information. And when that happens, very interesting legal cases arise. Uh, when in, in that situation, Comparative case law can help to expand expression and access information because using Colombia's database, you can search for legal standards that help your case and help improve uh, legal arguments. In this global movement for increased transparency, it is of course very useful to have a database where you can find case law with the best human rights standards. And I just wanna show, I want to go over a bit with uh, over the special collection of the case law freedom of expression a bit. As Juan said, there is a issue on transparency. It is called transparency in the spotlight, and it is. I just have to say that it 
it is based on a collaboration or it develops on a previous publication that was published by UNESCO and that has already been used by different um, legal professors in um, Latin America to uh, teach access to information standards. And this, but both, both texts, they use cases that can be found on Colombia's database. Um, concerning access to information, the database has, of course, the most relevant or most cited or most important decisions, such as the case from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, Cloud Regis v. Chile of 2006. It is the seminal case of access to information in the Latin American region, but you can find many other cases concerning many other different topics, such as COVID-19, the relationship between human rights violations and, and access to information and freedom of expression, if um, information contained in judicial records should be delivered, and many others. I just wanna, I just wanna say uh, or develop on one case that relates to what Juan was saying about privacy, and it is a case that you can find on the database, and it is just one of many others concerning this same topic, and is uh, on the maybe colliding rights of access to information on the one hand and privacy on the other hand. In many situations, when citizens request public information from public authorities, what we request is also personal information. So the judges have to question themselves. Is access to information going to prevail in this case, or is the protection of privacy and personal information going to prevail? Um, that is what the Transparency Council in Chile had to determine in a case where a woman requested information on the name, position, and salary of a public servant. And I think in this case, maybe Juan can help us going through the case. Um, but, and I'll just jump to some conclusions. Yes, because we're running short on time. Yes, just a short summary. Uh, this is a Ch Chilean case uh, in which a woman requested information about the salary of uh, one of its employees. Uh, of course, she requested uh, information from a public authority. Uh, the Council for Transparency considered that indeed uh, this information uh, had to be made public because the salary of this, of this public official was paid with public funds. Uh, and 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 I here I'm sure uh, Daniel can give you like the important insights uh, about this case, which indeed it brings this tension between access to information, privacy, and um, freedom of expression, especially access to information. Very briefly, Holly, before you take the floor, I just want to say that the question around salaries is very important because it is not. Um, a globally, there is not a global standard regarding salaries of public officials. Although in the inter-American context, it is quite maybe sometimes clear that salaries of public officials are public information, and even there is the the there is a law model on access to information that promotes that salaries are public information in not all countries of Europe and even in Latin America salaries are not public information. So if you are in a country where salaries are not public information and you wanna make salaries public information, like what happens in Colombia, you might use the cases that you can find in the database where judges in different jurisdictions considered that salaries were public information to promote and enhance your legal arguments towards achieving that salaries are effectively considered as public information. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel and uh, Juan Manuel. So now we're going to um, hand the floor to Nelly. And she's Good morning. from Kenya. Good morning. Good, Good morning. Good afternoon. It's afternoon <laughs> where I am here in Nairobi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. 
on behalf of CPIT and also Cyrilla, we are so grateful for the opportunity to showcase what Cyrilla is doing in educating the public on digital rights. So I'm going to share my screen so that uh, I think it's here. So building on the discussions that we are having uh, specifically on, you know, press freedom, digital rights, access to information, uh, this is what Cyrilla is doing. Specifically, we are notifying or updating uh, the public on digital rights and developments from the Global South. Uh, Nelly, can you make your um, screen, can you show the full slide? We're only seeing the um, the directions or the, uh, only seeing part of the screen. There, if you could just do the full slideshow. There we go, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so what I'm saying is Cyrilla is educating or informing the public on digital rights developments within the Global South. As we have identified, there is a continuous education and involvement of the people, activists, advocates, the judiciary, uh, academics, scholars on digital, or digital rights developments and education or advocacy across the world. What Cyrilla is doing is updating on legal data and analyzes legal data specifically on digital rights. It brings together a myriad of partners and more particularly Association for Progressive Communications, which specifically updates or informs on digital rights from East Asia, the Columbia University Global Freedom of Expression, which educates or updates data from the global, uh, Derechos Digitales, which notifies information on Latin America, social media exchange, which updates data from Middle East and North Africa, and more particularly CPIT, where I work from, uh, which is based at the Strathmore University, which updates information on Sub-Saharan Africa. So if you navigate and look at the Cyrilla website, you should be taken to this particular page where you can identify or search for case laws, uh, legal instruments, case analysis on digital rights from the Global South. So it's an open database that allows you to navigate and search for any information depending on either the keywords, depending on the country, depending on the case itself, if you have information about it. So Cyrilla noted that there was a gap in the update of information on digital rights. And that is why it came up with this particular database to specifically do these particular updates. So uh, to just bring into context, this Cyrilla has so far updated 1,435 case laws from the Global South, 645, uh, 648 case laws, uh, 150 case analyses, and uh, all this information is from 150 countries or regions from the Global South. So CPIT focuses specifically on research or data updates from Sub-Saharan Africa. So that is where our focus is, and we do the updates of these particular cases. So Cyrilla, updates on in English and other languages and equally does translations uh, and updates all those information in the database. So to bring into perspective what Cyrilla specifically does and what CPIT is doing within Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm going to take you through as an hypothetical case. It's not very novel, but it's something that has been seen in quite a number of African countries. And as the previous speakers highlighted, there is a need you know, for more research on internet shutdowns during election yearing period. And this particular case gives a synopsis of how uh, the cases or how the rights have been violated during the election yearing period. Thereafter, I'm going to all equally take you through some of the cases, three cases that have been uploaded to the Srila database to specifically just give a comparative analysis of how or whatever cases we highlight or talk about or update about uh, on the Cyrilla database. So in this particular hypothetical case, we're looking at uh, a republic named Zaraya. It's non-existent, but we consider it to be within the sub-Saharan part of Africa. And it's about to hold its election, which is uh, apparently supposed to take place in December of this year. And uh, Berlin is one of the entrants in the election race and is, is quite young. And at the moment during elections or the, during campaigns, he has gained a lot of popularity at the rate of 47%. The president uh, who is also going for his second and last term. Popularity is way below, that is around 43%. And the government has noted that Berlin is using the digital platform specifically to grain uh, voters uh, within Zaraya. So the government has noted that 
the digital platform is his main tool of campaigning. What the government has done is suspended licenses and disabled social media platforms all in the quest of frustrating uh, his campaign strategies. Some of the campaign managers and Berlin equally has at some point been arrested because of his use and campaigns uh, on the social media platform. So there has been continuous frustrations by the government on his use of the digital platform. This is something that has been witnessed in some of the African countries. So uh, what Berlin is seeking is uh, a quest for justice because he is someone who is financially constrained and is not in a position to do physical campaigns and the social media has been his major avenue for campaigning. So what the audience could ask themselves in the case is what rights have been violated in the circumstances or what digital rights of Berlin have been violated? Which legal instruments could he, for example, be relying on specifically in advocating or seeking for justice for the closure of the internet by the government? What is his available recourse? I'll leave you to think about these questions. Uh, and if you would need a follow up, you can uh, ask questions from my end and I'll be glad to answer. To further showcase what Surreal is working on, I'll just take you through three key cases from the sub Saharan part of Africa, which highlights uh, the circumstances or gives instances on how the courts have addressed the jurisprudence on digital rights. I'm looking at the case from a Kenyan court, a Ugandan court, and also the ECOWAS Court of Justice. And in the Kenyan court, all the three cases respond to various uh, digital rights, more particularly the rights to access information, freedom of expression, freedom of the media, rights of the marginalized, rights to social media and electronic constitutional rights and the rights to access to justice is something that you'd note the court in Uganda was not very open to it because it feels not very developed. Now, in the case of the Kenya High Court decision, this is a case that was lodged by Ceramite for minority rights developments against the government, uh, more particularly challenging the decision by the government to launch an integrated political party system, which sort of made uh, registration of political parties and access to all political parties information to the digital platform that is the e-citizen platform which manages government services. Saramad was specifically challenging the digitalization process for violating the rights of the minorities and the indigenous uh, people uh, on account of that they had no access to the internet. So based on the previous statistics, very few people are from the marginalized communities and the indigenous people could access the internet. And by digitalizing this particular uh, service, they were being locked out from accessing this information. So they could not access uh, the political party system. And of course, their rights to access to politics and also access to information was violated. They equally asked the courts to consider that there were no public participation in the launch of this particular system. The court uh, held upon analysis of the case that in as much as it was necessary for the system to be updated and launched on the digital platform, the government had a duty to ensure that, that it, does, it did that while taking into account the rights of all people, including the rights of the marginalized. And in so doing, it had to put in place mechanisms to ensure that the marginalized communities equally had access to this particular platform. So the government asked, uh, the court asked the government to ensure that these particular rights were protected and ask them to put in place avenues or mechanisms that considered the rights of the marginalized communities. Over in Uganda, you would see equally the court's decision in unwanted witness limited versus the attorney general. Uh, this case concerns election or uh, sh internet shutdown or social media shutdown during the election year in period. In 2016, the government shut down uh, the internet or the social media during presidential and parliamentary elections and equally during the swearing in of the president elect. Uh, and so the petition was challenging specifically the internet shutdown on account that it violated the rights to freedom of speech, expression, livelihood and access to the internet. While the courts considered that there was merit in the case, it indicated that it lacked jurisdiction to hear the matter on account that the rights to access to the internet was quite novel and it was not enunciated, it was not contained in the existing legal framework on access uh, or on these rights. So the court specifically on that basis 
indicated that it had no power to hear it because it was not containing the existing legislations. It therefore urged parliaments to con consider reviewing policies specifically to cater for the rights to access to the internet and more particularly digital rights. So it indicated that there was no clear human rights framework that had been indicated or uh, that the rights to internet and electronic money transfer was not clearly en enunciated within the domestic legal framework. So it could not determine uh, the particular case on that basis. So the case was struck out on those accounts because it was not uh, recognized by domestic legislations. An interesting case by the ECOWAS Court of Justice is the registered trustees of the Society of the Society Economic Rights and Accountability Project, Sarah versus three others and the Federal Republic of Nigeria is quite an interesting case and it builds a very nice jurisprudence on internet shutdown. In 2021, the Nigerian government suspended Twitter on account so that Twitter was undermining Nigeria's corporate existence. And uh, the claim particularly challenged the shutdown or the suspension of Twitter on account of violation of the rights to freedom of expression, media and access to information. The Court of Justice highlighted and identified key provisions under the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, more particularly on the right of freedom of, freedom of speech and the rights to access information. The, the court noted that in accessing the rights to freedom of speech and the rights to access information, it could be done through social media platforms such as Twitter. So they were complementary means to accessing these two vital rights, which had equally been domesticated in Nigeria. So the court equally asked the Nigerian government to only, or the court noted that the derogation from these particular rights could only be done where there was lawful justification either by law, court order, or otherwise. In this circumstance, there was no court order, there was no law that allowed for the suspension of, of Twitter. In this regard, the court found that the shutdown or the suspension of Twitter was unlawful and therefore ask the Nigerian government to restore it. All the three cases have identified some of the key uh, digital rights cases that Surila is looking at. So Surila has been working on this database for the past three years. It's a work in progress. It's something that is currently ongoing and all of the three partners are identifying, uploading to the database cases on digital rights, such as those that I have examined or have explained today case laws, legal analysis on landmark cases from the global south and updates them to the database. So this is something that we are going or it's ongoing and we keep uh, checking and updating uh, the database. That should be all from uh, the CPT team and Cyrilla. We'll be glad to take any questions should there be any. Thank you so much, Nale. Those were great examples. And I should mention that we are going to be publishing a special collection paper on internet shutdown specifically, and they do cover those cases that Nelly has just mentioned. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we're going to move on right now. We're now going to look at restrictions on freedom of expression um, in the context of hate speech and humor. And we're going to start with Dr. Natalie Alkiviadu, Research Fellow for Future of Free Speech, and she's going to discuss hate speech standards uh, from their database. Natalie, you are on. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, really sad that I can't be in New York, but um, it's fine. Uh, so I've got 10 minutes just to go over a very practical um, uh, kind of summary of what we as the future of free speech uh, can offer in terms of uh, databases on hate speech case law. So basically keep in mind that uh, although I'm not going to go into any substantive um, matters, our databases are open and available to any scholars, activists, lawyers, uh, etc., who want to be able to quickly come up with good practices on um, uh, hate speech uh, jurisprudence. So I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see it? Holly, is it okay? Not yet. No, there we go. But we'll just need you to bring up the individual slides. Is it okay? No, because we're we're not seeing the slideshow yet. There you go. It's okay? 
Yep, that's perfect. Okay, cool. So, um, let's start with the European Court of Human Rights. So essentially we have two databases that can be uh, com complementary to any other databases that um, uh, exist uh, on, I don't know, a US level or an international level as, uh, as yours, um, uh, Holly, et cetera. The first one is the European Court of Human Rights. So what we've done essentially is compiled all hate speech database, um, all hate speech jurisprudence until 2021. I think there's one case missing because we're still follow, uh, we're waiting for a follow up. And what we've done is we've divided uh, the actual database into different themes. So as you see on the slide, we have um, the theme of violence more generally, uh, the theme of ethnic hatred, religious hatred, um, LGBTQ rights, etc. So if I'm um, an activist working on uh, preparing a strategic litigation on um, homophobic speech, I can just go onto this database, click on LGBTQ rights and see what the European Court of Human Rights has said uh, on this theme. So it's as simple as that. Um, and if you see my mouse, um, so for for example, the latest case we have on, on a Council of Europe level is the case of Lillian Dahl versus Iceland, where essentially the, the court uh, outlined for the first time the threshold of what hate speech is. So the three most serious forms of, of, of hate speech. So um, let's assume that I'm, um, I'm, 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 I'm working for an NGO um, in wherever, and I want to see what's going on with um, um, homophobic speech. I go onto this database, I click here, I see all the cases of the European Court of Human Rights, and I see what has happened um, in terms of what the court has decided. This does not mean that we as the FFS promote any particular framework through which, so I'm just getting my phone so I can time myself quickly. Oh, I've got eight minutes. Um, this does not mean that we're promoting any particular case or any particular approach. This is really important for, for me to underline here, especially because I'm online and I'm not there with you. Um, we're simply giving the information of what's out there. So just as I can find good practices, I can also find bad, bad practices, practices I want to avoid, or practices that I could foresee that a, um, a, a judicial body may um, uh, come up with on, for example, a first instance level, and then I can have argumentation for the, for the next levels. Um, and the cool thing is, I know it's a little bit of self-promotion on, on the part of the FFS, is that I can view uh, the database both in terms of a country, but also in terms of theme. So um, that's really important, particularly within uh, the European framework, where we have a very particular history on, on hate speech and the impacts of World War II and the use of hate speech during World War II. It's really interesting for someone for example, a scholar, um, to look up what the approach is of, of German courts. And by default, when you read European Courts of Human Rights case law, you also can see what has happened on a national level. So that's um, quite interesting. And, and to add to the themes, so let's go back to homophobic speech, which, which is what I, I've chosen today is it, to, to give an example throughout the databases. Uh, we also compile all the relevant documents uh, which exist on the Council of Europe level. So for example, uh, documents from the Parliamentary Assembly, from the European Commission Against the Racism and Intolerance, anything that exists on a, on a Council of Europe level on, on hate speech is on our database. So it's nothing novel in terms of us, you know, telling you, wow, uh, we've thought of this, or it's, this is really innovative. Essentially, we're compiling something. So we're making things easier for, for, for people who want to be involved uh, in that. And that can also be policymakers. It could be tech companies who are drawing up guidelines on hate speech. It can be, a, you know, anyone working on, on, on the matter. Um, so hang on. Yeah, I've told you that. Um, just a little add-on, which... I mean, again, I think it's more, more interesting from academics uh, potentially, but uh, also for policymakers. What we did is essentially we thought, okay, it would be cool to compile all these cases and help people out to pick, you know, pick and choose and see what they, how they can use it. But then we came up with statistics because at the FFS, as Holly knows, we love infographics and you know, kind of making uh, numbers out of everything. So these are results that we, we found. We, we had found 60 hate speech cases between 1979. So the data is really important because that means that we also include 
all the decisions before um, the European Commission uh, became uh, kind of defunct, as, uh, as to say, uh, until, yeah, 2020, that's it, not 2021. And then you see, for example, here that how many cases were brought by the speakers, how many cases uh, led to a non-violation of Article 10, that being the, the freedom of expression under the European uh, Convention on, on Human Rights, um, how many uh, cases involved the media. So you see, uh, if you see here, I'm not sure if you see my mouse, uh, uh, cases which were brought by media professionals, um, uh, so the journalists in particular, were the most um, uh, cases uh, uh, brought before the European Court of Human Rights. Okay, so I think that's really important um, uh, today. Um, and then, you know, any, you know, it's all on our website. Um, I, I don't know if we're going to share the slides later, but you can just click and see and 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 and, and view. Um, and in addition to the European uh, Court of Human Rights website, we also have a compilation of all uh, hate speech um, cases on a UN level. So, for example, uh, the Human Rights Committee, uh, uh, the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, but also the Committee on uh, the Elimination of um, uh, uh, Discrimination uh, Against Women, which are the three committees essentially that have dealt with cases. So that's also um, an important thing um, for anyone involved in. In, in the theme on a practical level um, to remember that on a UN level, it's not just a human rights committee committee that has come up with jurisprudence. And it's not just the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We also have case law, particularly within the um, uh, sphere of um, homophobic speech and, and gender equality. We have really important case law, particularly against um, uh, the Russian Federation, um, which can be useful for uh, people involved in strategic uh, litigation um, on, on, on hate speech. Sorry, I'm talking so fast, but it's, it's just too exciting. So look, so here's the, the, the database, the image. So look at all the cases we have from the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. All you need to do is, for example, click on one of them, I don't know, um, um, the, the, the Turkish Union, um, and then you have our summary. So we have uh, what the important paragraphs from the case uh, is, what the summary of the case is, what the finding was, uh, very much like um, uh, the Columbia uh, database. So it's very easy just to scroll through and see. If that's a case that interests me and I think it's going to help my strategic litigation, for example, my research or whatever else, I can go to the link and read the full thing. But I'm not going to waste my time um, on something that at the end can't help me because uh, I've already been given uh, the summary. We also have everything on the Human Rights Committee level, and we also have um, the, the, the Russian Federation cases. And again, what we do have is we divide things thematically. I think that's really important for the databases so that people don't have to scroll through all hate speech um, cases um, uh, with, you know, on all themes that may not be um, directly relevant. Um, and again, as with the Council of Europe, we do have all the relevant UN documents um, um, uh, on hate speech. And you can browse those by country. So for example, there could be a general comment by um, um, the Human Rights Committee um, on, I don't know, let's say Denmark for now. Um, and, and I can view that and, and parts that involve the, the, the hate speech, or I can, for example, general comment number 34, which is very important to hate speech. I, I view all that, and then I can view all the documents uh, by theme. So if I there's documents on anti-Semitism, um, for example, or, or, or um, homophobic, uh, LGBTQ rights, I can just view them all here. So it saves me a lot of time as a researcher. So here are some examples. And of course, we have all, all the relevant opinions by the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of uh, expression. Um, very quickly, because I've only got two minutes. Um, I, I came up with this uh, just to show you um, how someone could actually use the databases. So this comes from the very, very famous, infamous, I don't know, or at least exciting case of Quilani uh, versus the South African Human Rights Commission, which reached um, the South African Constitutional Court, um, where there was um, a first pager by um, uh, uh, the, the the by Quilani uh, and and the, the the title being call me names but gay is not okay and then we have this image here who um, which could be be offensive to some but then the, the issue um, 
um, a free freedom of expression does come up. So let's say I have a case. I, I was litigating Quilani and I uh, was on strategic, strategic litigation, for example, and I had very little funds and very little time. Um, what could I do? I could do this. I could go to the European Court of Human Rights database. I could pick up the two first cases of Veyland versus Sweden and Lilienthal versus Iceland. I could pick up any good practices to help with my, my case analysis. Uh, then I could turn to Colombia's um, uh, database. I could pick up Schneider versus Phelps, which also uh, gives an overview of how homophobic speech has been dealt with by, uh, in the US and also um, um, uh, access Quilani versus South African Human Rights Commission and another. And I could see all these different approaches and that could help me in compiling my, my case or that could help me in uh, preparing my case notes or my journal article or whatever else. So it's very important, I think, for all of us to kind of have this transition and this compilation of all databases together because I don't think they should be used individually. Um, so even if I'm preparing a case before the European Court of Human Rights, or even in the case of Quilani, uh, the court, the constitutional court actually quotes, unfortunately, in my opinion, but we don't have time for that, the European Court of Human Rights and some of the uh, positions it took, um, uh, which were more speech restrictive than the previous court. But anyway, so we need to... What I'm trying to stress uh, to everyone today is that all these databases that are being presented, it doesn't matter what country we're litigating in or what country we're re researching in. Um, they should be uh, kind of looked at in tandem. Um, and just a concluding comment, and then I'm completely on, on time. Uh, I hope the databases uh, give us a quick understanding of the cases. They uh, give us an ability to determine good practices that can be followed in case preparation, for example. And they're useful for all of us, scholars, lawyers, activists, civil society and organizations. And the two things that I, I want you to keep in mind is that firstly, we do divide things thematically, but we also do divide things by country. And not only do we provide the, the case law, uh, we also give you the information that comes as a kind of secondary uh, sources like general comments and whatever else. And I feel I spoke very fast, but I hope I gave you a good overview uh, or a, a satisfactory overview of what our databases could do to help um, the freedom of speech and, and media freedom. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Natalie. And for those of you who are more interested in hate speech, she is per right now writing a paper for us. It's going to be the, a new edition of our special collection on hate speech. It's going to delve into many of these cases she discussed. So this is a perfect segue to humor. So now I'm going to pass the floor um, to Dr. Alberto Godioli, who is um, joining us from the Netherlands, and Dr. Laura Little, Little from the Temple University Law School. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Holly, for your very kind invitation and introduction. I will start by sharing my screen so that I can use it to accompany our short presentation. Hopefully, you're all able to see it now. Is it working? Yes. Yes, that's great. So it's really an honor to be here today to introduce our database focusing on humor-related jurisprudence. Uh, my name is Alberto Godioli, and just to give you some context, I am principal investigator of a, of a project titled Humor in Court, uh, which is funded by the Dutch Research Council, as you can see here from 2022 to 2027. And the project aims to facilitate a more consistent approach to the interpretation of humor and satire in free speech jurisprudence, uh, especially by bringing together legal scholarship and practice on the one hand, and humanities-based humor studies on the other. Um, so within this project, I am coordinating an interdisciplinary team, including two legal experts, Jennifer Young and Matteo Fiori, and a PhD student with a humanities background, namely Melissa Leopards. Uh, so in October 2020, we also teamed up with Professor Laura Little, uh, who has written a seminal book on humor and the law in the United States, among many other things. Uh, and, uh, and together we created the Forum for Humor and the Law, also known as Forum, um, uh, which is a platform, as you can see here, for, for lawyers, humor scholars, and anyone really who is interested in the nexus of humor and uh, free speech adjudication. We have a website at uh, www.forum.org, uh, a newsletter, which you can sign up for by uh, this button circled in red, and most importantly today, we have a growing database of humor 
jurisprudence from all over the world. We started only fairly recently, but mostly thanks to the amazing work of Jennifer Young, who is also here with us today online. Uh, we already have around 200 cases uh, in the database, spanning over several different themes from uh, humor and hate speech, especially disparaging humor and hate speech, uh, which Natalie also touched upon in her presentation, to satire and defamation, or a parody and copyright law, for example. Uh, for time reasons, however, today we will only focus on one theme, namely the line between political satire on the one hand and defamation or dignitary harm on the other hand. Uh, the first example we would like to mention from our database is actually a historical landmark case from the United States, which uh, Laura will tell us more about. So, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I too am delighted to be here. I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit about probably the most important humor case from the United States Supreme Court, Hustler versus Falwell. And um, the, the case began with a, an ad campaign that was run by the Campari Company, in which the Campari Company featured famous people talking about their first time. The idea being that Campari is an acquired taste as an aperitif, and that, in fact, um, they, it's an allusion um, to their first time having sex. Well, what the Hustler magazine did, which some people may call a parody magazine, others may call obscene, um, what they did was they they did a riff on this, this particular advertisement um, that Campari had in a series of publications dealing with the Reverend Jerry Falwell, who was an um, evangelistic minister who had a lot of, shall we say, opinions about the relationship between politics and law. And you probably can't see on the screen the precise language. However, the, the thrust of it is Jerry Falwell's first time having sex with his mother in an outhouse. Well, needless to say, Falwell was not pleased. He brought suit. Um, and the case ultimately came to the United States Supreme Court. And what's important for the purpose of evaluating the relationship of law and humor is that the court was extremely vibrant about its protection of humor. And in particular, the fact that this was a parody, the importance of parody to culture and history and political debate. Uh, so even though he the 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 court acknowledged that this particular parody was a far cry from the political parodies that we've seen throughout history, it nevertheless deserved the protection of the United States Supreme Court. So what this case points out, I think, in terms of the comparative enterprise of what we're trying to do with Forum, is to show that. First of all, there's a lot of connections in this particular case having to do with the fact that Falwell was a public figure talking about matters of public opinion, and that can help map the line between what is the type of humor that should be protected by freedom of communication principles and what is in fact actionable when there's individual harm that occurs. So with that, I will pass um, pass the microphone or the, the hypothetical microphone back to Dr. Goldioli, um, and he'll give you an example from another context. Perfect. Thank you very much, Laura. And in short, following up on Laura, I just wanted to show how a quick search through our database allows us to compare Hustler with also more recent cases from all over the world simply by choosing defamation from our main themes menu, for example. In, in our case too, you can search by region, uh, country, and uh, uh, like chronological window, and so on and so forth. So it's also possible to combine different criteria. Anyway, um, if we look at the results of, of our quick search, we can see that some important cases from different regions are indeed consistent with the Hustler approach in terms of expanding expression. Uh, for example, in Telo de Abreu in Portugal from 2022, uh, which concerns a, a series of 
satirical cartoons targeting local politicians. The European uh, Court of Human Rights reinstated their well-established principle whereby satire is a form of artistic expression and social commentary and an interference with an artist's right to such expression must be examined with particular care. Um, although in her concurring opinion, Judge Motoc also uh, stressed uh, the, the, the harm caused by the uh, sexist stereotypes used in those cartoons, which she defines as symbolic violence bordering on hate speech. Likewise, however, the database features more examples from contexts as, as diverse as Lesotho and Argentina, where the contested expression, again, uh, in this case, uh, in this case is a satirical column and a photo montage, respectively, was uh, seen as lawful, as a lawful form of political criticism rather than defamation. Um, on the other hand, and yeah. I'm sorry, Alberto, um, like two minutes. Okay, I will wrap it up very quickly. Uh, on the other hand, our search also shows some more worrying instances of a much more restrictive approach to satirical criticism, including, for instance, the infamous Hanson case from Australia, where the Court of Appeal upheld uh, the injunction against a satirical song mocking a conservative politician, or these more recent cases from Turkey and Thailand, which resulted in prison sentences for uh, people who had shared satirical material targeting Turkish President Erdogan and the Thai monarchy, respectively. So the examples could continue, but hopefully this already illustrates how the database can be used to identify international standards, exceptions, and trends regarding humor and free speech. Uh, I'll give the floor very briefly back to Laura for one last question or discussion point for the audience, perhaps, uh, or just to wrap it up. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, in addition to the various themes that you can find in our database, there's one overarching concern that we have in mind, and that is where do you draw the line between humor and humorous distortion on one hand, and apparently factual or not necessarily true statements on the other hand. And we'd love to hear from you as to what kind of factors go into drawing that line. I've, I've, I've identified one in terms of the importance of political critique, political debate, but I'm sure there's many more ideas out there. So please get in touch with us at forum.org. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura and um, Alberto. So we are really short on time, but we're going to now move on to practitioners and we're going to learn about how they use comparative law in their strategic litigation. And we're going to start with um, Raisa Carrillo, Coordinator of Protection and Legal Defense for Journalists at Fundación para la Libertad de Prensa, or FLIP, in Colombia. And she's going to present uh, on some emerging standards on the protection of women journalists in Latin America. FLIP was the winner of the 2022 Global Freedom of Expression Prize in Excellence in Legal Services, along with the Center for Justice and International Law for representing journalist Judith Bedoya Lima before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So five minutes. <laughs> yes, for, um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, uh, this is a true privilege for me to be part of this uh, conversation with you. And uh, I to keep it short, I just do, will do three remarks. The first of them is that uh, I'm very happy to see all these efforts to create these databases. This is um, this is great for the work for non-governmental organizations, especially, especially for those that we are working on strategic litigation to bring strong cases. We need these kind of tools. And as you wholly um, said earlier, this is also a, a way that legal actors get involved and judges get involved in providing better decisions and, and more effective uh, protection of freedom of expression and protection. Um, in Colombia, uh, database we we saw you included a case of Gina Bedoya this is the case where a journalist was she was threatened before she was kidnapped tortured and sexually assaulted 20 years ago and this case is is a landmark decision for us because it brings some ideas on how uh, threats should be investigated the inter-american court ruled this case two years ago and they created this um this rule where states are obligated and they have a special obligation regarding the intersectionality uh, protection obligation. They have to take into account the fact that uh, Jeanette was, uh, is a woman, and then there is like a slight difference um, in the obligation of protection and the fact that she was a journalist. So they they ask the uh, the state, and this will be 
uh, decision that should be um, more open for other states in Latin America where they have to make stronger analysis of the context and all these small factors. Um, why FLIP supported this case? I think this is very important um, to highlight. It's because we wanted to tackle two problems, the inter intersection of protection and impunity. And, I, and for us, the, this decision is, is really um, valuable because it, it provides specific guidelines on how gender perspective has to be taken into account how the risk of journalism must be assessed correctly in the decisions and how the armed conflict, um, as in Colombia happens, uh, must be also taken into account in these decisions. Um, I would, to finish, would like to, to highlight that you, you are making a big effort so all these databases are available in other languages. I think this is extremely relevant for strategic litigation in the region, specifically in Latin America, where many authoritarian regimes are spreading and all these cases should serve as an inspiration in in the region and for the case of Jeanette um, just to leave this idea is that in the concurrent opinion from Justice Perez Manrique he highlights the problem of online violence so despite these cases is the facts of these cases occurred 20 years ago the court also creates makes an effort to bring it to the current challenges. So I think this case, uh, I hope this, it serves as an inspiration for other organizations. Oh, that's brilliant. So it's such a fascinating case. Thank you for sharing that with us. And now we're gonna move on to Stephen Townley. He's the legal director of Trial Watch Initiative at the Clooney Foundation for Justice. And he's going to discuss the criminalization of speech under vague and overbroad laws and some of the cases that they're working on. Thanks very much, Holly, and thank you to Columbia Global Freedom of Expression and UNESCO for organizing this and for the interesting presentations on Cirilla Forum and the Future of Free Speech project that we've heard. Um, Trial Watch, very briefly, monitors criminal trials globally against those who are most vulnerable and advocates for the rights of those unfairly prosecuted or convicted. We're also building a global justice index to evaluate and rank countries based on their criminal justice system from data we gather inside courtrooms, which is then evaluated by legal experts. So I'm gonna talk very briefly, since I know we're coming to the end here, about a trend we've seen in terms of the use of vague and overbroad laws to criminalize reporting and dissent, and then the potential for comparative law, including from the databases that we're talking about to help. So very briefly, I'm gonna mention three examples. In Malaysia, a blogger was prosecuted under Malaysia's Communication and Multimedia Act for offensive communication based on blog posts critical of the King and Prime Minister in relation to COVID-19. In Hong Kong, a radio host and opposition figure was prosecuted for sedition, among other offenses, for speeches at public gatherings. And in Cambodia, a journalist was prosecuted for incitement to disrupt social order for Facebook posts critical of the government. Now, these laws all share a common feature, which is broad and underdefined terms. So in Malaysia, the law criminalizes any comment, request, suggestion, or other communication which is obscene, indecent, false, menacing, or offensive in character with intent to annoy, abuse, threaten, or harass another person. Many sedition laws around the world criminalize terms like exciting disaffection against the government. And Cambodia's incitement law does not define disruption of social order. There's an inherent subjectivity in many of these terms. For instance, in a case in Tunisia brought under a relatively similar offensive communication law, a blogger was prosecuted for criticizing police violence on Facebook with the prosecution sparked by a police official who said that he had been personally offended. In the Malaysian case, a witness who testified for the prosecution didn't speak to the defendant's intent, just about his reactions when reading the blog post. And in the Cambodia case, the one prosecution witness, a police officer, spoke about how the defendant's posts could have provoked social disorder. Many of these laws have analogs across jurisdictions. So I've mentioned Malaysia's offensive communication law, which is similar not only to one in Tunisia, but also one in Uganda, which was used in a case we monitored against prominent women's rights activist, Stella Nianzi. 
I'll come back to Uganda in a second because the story, there's some reason for optimism there. Um, sedition, of course, is relatively widespread throughout many former British colonies. And while it's not a perfect analog, Bangladesh's Digital Security Act also criminalizes online material that deteriorates or advances to deteriorate the law and order situation. So bearing some resemblance to the Cambodia law I was just describing. Now, to the comparative law piece. Um, many apex courts around the world have developed jurisprudence on the concept of a law being void for vagueness. And I wanna briefly compare language used by the Indian Supreme Court in striking down that country's offensive communication law with that used by Uganda's constitutional court, which actually did the same earlier this year. So India, um, where the persons applying the law, quote, are in a boundless sea of uncertainty and the law prima facie takes away a guaranteed freedom, the law must be held to offend the constitution. Now, Uganda, laws which do not state explicitly and definitely what conduct is punishable are void for vagueness. A statute is also void for vagueness if a legislature's delegation of authority to judges and or administrators is so extensive that it would lead to arbitrary prosecutions. So you can see similarities and linkages that can be drawn among these cases. I'd also note there was a recent decision in Pakistan striking down their sedition law, which referred to developments in other jurisdictions. And at the regional level, there were two decisions, one in West Africa and one in East Africa, which dealt with sedition among other laws. And the East African Court of Justice cited the ECOWAS court judgment in coming to its own conclusions. We at CFJ are currently participating as an amicus in a case challenging Malaysia's offensive communication law, which is an opportunity to highlight some of these developments such as in India and Uganda. And in Cambodia, we obtained a positive decision from the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention on the Cambodian journalist's case, not only with respect to his detention, but also finding that the incitement law in question was inconsistent with international standards. So having resources like the ones we're talking about today is really helpful in marshalling arguments about how courts should address these laws. And these laws are the ones that are so susceptible to abuse. So that's why I think this conversation is extremely valuable for providing um, those kinds of resources. And I will stop there. Thank you, Steve. Those were like incredible examples, very, very illustrative of, of what we're trying to do here. So I want to thank all of the partners who have contributed today. And I must apologize that we have run out of time. Yes, maybe. I, I, you, I just I wanted to, to, mm -hmm, uh, I to give an example. Mm -hmm. an, an example also that we we didn't mention about the use of that database is uh, when we do a training workshop with judges or prosecutors, we actually uh, anonymize some case from a human rights court, regional human rights court with a Joe Doe or something like this. And then we make them, uh, we divide the, the groups in, in three groups, defendant and prosecution and, and the judge. And, uh, and we make them work on that. We make some kind of mock uh, trial in the, uh, during the training. And it's very interesting to see, but first they take it really at heart. They are very, very uh, pugnous uh, um, uh, legal experts and judges, etc. So they take it very much. And then we show what's the decision of mm -hmm. the human rights court at the end and, and the justification. And we use really the database uh, really and, and, and show and for them to, to, uh, to reflect on the, what was at the end the decision of the, uh, so that, that's also, it's a, one way of using this database. I think that uh, that is interesting because if you only do the capacity building like this, it's really much more efficient when you have this kind of very concrete case that they have to think and work and, and, and then at the end, it really, it, it makes their reflection uh, progress, I think. Just wanted to share that. No, thank you so much, because we are going to be doing a series of, of trainings um, in cooperation with UNESCO, and we will be employing some of those techniques. But thank you again. The next panel is at the door waiting to get in. So I'm afraid we really have to close. But thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know where the 50 people were there.